Good morning, it's Meg Riley in Minneapolis, Minnesota, welcoming you to another episode of The View. This morning, we're excited to have three members of the Leadership Collective of Allies for Racial Equity, and we'll be getting to them in just a minute. Um, I, I just wanted to introduce myself by saying, if you saw that Seinfeld show where they got the water, uh, the good shower heads and everybody's hair got flatter and flatter throughout the show, in Minnesota, our equivalent is hat head. And so all of our hair just gets more staticky and flat as the winter goes on. So this is my hair this morning. I'm sure you wouldn't have known that, but I had to say it because it might stick up in the middle of the show. You know, it's just welcome to winter in Minnesota. Christina, you're in the South there. Is it better? It is super cold. We had absolutely no autumn. We're right into winter. Um, we. Our kids have already had their first inclement weather days and they're expecting some big thing that, you know, is either going to happen this weekend or not. You know, <laughs> and it's kind of the way it goes during the winter here. Um, and I would just, uh, you know, actually have a shout out for Charlottesville in general. Um, if folks can hold Charlottesville in your prayers, um, your good thoughts this week and next we are now having the trial of the um, man who used his car uh, to drive into the crowd and, and kill and, and injure people last year during last year's August 12th, um, uh, Unite the Right rally. And that trial is going on and it has been extraordinarily painful uh, to relive for a lot of folks in town. So please, um, if you can keep Charlottesville folks in your prayers, that would be great. Michael. Good morning, everyone. Michael Tino here in sunny, beautiful Peekskill, New York. Um, it's it's winter here too, so but I haven't been outside with a hat on my head yet. So uh, hopefully, my hair will not be flying anywhere. The three hairs that I have left will not be flying anywhere this morning. How how are things out in on the West Coast, Jessica? Well, the sun is struggling to rise still. So send good thoughts my way. Um, I am on uh, the Facebook live chat following um, your questions and comments that I'm going to pass on to our hosts and guests. I'm on Twitter, hashtag The View. And yeah, without Asia here this morning, who we miss, and I hope she's doing well, I'm holding it down here, West Coast, 8 a.m. That's true. Some weeks it's a lot of early morning risers, and today you, you are holding it together there, Jessica. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, let's move right into our guests. So we have um, we have three members, as I said, of the Leadership Collective of Allies for Racial Equity. And that one is Chris Jimerson, who's the Minister for Program Development from Austin, First UU Church of Austin. Um, another is Elka Carrier-Ladd, who's a minister who coordinates youth programs at the UU Church of Muncie, Indiana. And the third is another Hoosier who moved west but what time zone are you all now, Lori? I don't understand Arizona and time zones. I'm always in Mount, Mountain Standard Time, okay. which sometimes means I look like I'm in Pacific Daylight Time. Right, because they don't do daylight savings time. Well, neither does Indiana, right? So you, you kept it. Well, they used it. to not until Mitch Daniels changed that. <laughs> there you go. And Lori is um, also in the, the team, and she is the CLF Director of Technology. And... Um, yeah, and all of these folks also do kinds of all kinds of local activism, which we'll talk about as well. I wanted to mention um, that here in Minneapolis, local activists actually uh, went to the city council meeting and testified heavily, and uh, they were going to add a million dollars to the police budget, and they didn't. So it's all going to go into community safety instead. So activism can work. We have a great city council. Lori, how'd it go out your way? I know you had a similar thing going on. Uh, not as well as in Minneapolis. I was so glad to see that come out for you guys that way because it's a testament to the groundwork and the community building that Minneapolis and St. Paul have in that area. In Phoenix, yeah, just yesterday, the city council uh, passed a $4 million budget for the deadliest police force in, in the United States. So um, our police force has shot 41 people this year and 21 of those have died. And so more people of color. We have been pressuring them. The vast majority are, are people of color because that's 
what happens um, in a white supremacist society and particularly in the Phoenix area um, with the Joe Arpaio culture in our, in our law enforcement. So uh, we have a organization here called Put Air in Action in Puente and a few others as well, the Poor People's Campaign who've been putting pressure consistently on um, this, the elected officials uh, throughout the last several months and even years. And that came to a head yesterday when we disrupted the city council chambers during the budget hearing for the passage of the police uh, budget in which there were at least 30 police officers there. Uh, and we were able to unfurl a 25 foot long banner inside the chambers and hold it down for about 20 minutes uh, with chanting and so forth. And they still passed it, but we were there. Uh, and the Patriot Movement, by the way, was there as well. So it was a pretty intense um, inter interaction, but uh, we just keep, keep going. So. And as you mentioned, that action, certainly the activism here in the Twin Cities led by people of color led mm -hmm. by groups um, that are people of color. And so you're a group of, of white allies. So let's talk about the particular roles that, um, that white allies can have. So why, why does ARE exist? Let's start with that. Elka, I hear you're the, you've been there the longest. So why don't you um, start and tell us why you, you know, why you got involved and why you feel like it's important that it exists. Um, so we started and Michael may know more of the history of this than I do um, because he was there before me and we overlapped slightly. Um, we started because there was uh, originally a drum caucus of white folks um, and drum determined that it would be better for all of us uh, if, we, if they sent us forth as uh, our own organization to intentionally be in uh, accountable relationship with DRUM, uh, but so that we could do the work of uprooting white supremacy in ourselves and in or our institutions uh, separately and allow them to do their work, uh, which is vastly different in how it looks, uh, though with the same end goals, right? Uh, so, I came to be on leadership about seven years ago now, um, at which time our relationship with DRUM was very formalized, um, but we also learned over time that our leadership overturned regularly, DRUM leadership overturned regularly, and it made building deep relationships really difficult. Uh, because that takes time, right? Uh, so that's one of the reasons why our organizational model has shifted. Uh, but I didn't tell you anything about what, why I do it. And you asked me about that as well. Um, and it's hard to say that briefly, but um, my parents had a huge role in it. Um, my mom is a, feminist queer woman uh, who has a little brother with Down syndrome. Uh, so she taught me real young about ableism and um, heteropatriarchy. And uh, my father was uh, the president of LRY in 69 and 70 and was really engaged in what was happening within the UUA during that time. Um, and that really formed him in some really profound ways. And both of them really formed how I come to be in the world. Uh, and I came of age in YRUU during the time that we were beginning identity caucusing, during the time that Groundwork Collective was being creative, created, uh, a time that the kinds of anti-racism work we were doing and that the youth were leading on were, was groundbreaking and really exciting. Uh, so my identity as a Unitarian Universalist is deeply wrapped up in anti-racism work. Uh, and the more, and it's been about 18 years since then. Uh, and the more I learn and the more I learn and the more I learn, uh, it's just so clear to me that white supremacy undergirds all of the other oppressions that 
uh, as a woman, as a queer person, as a woman who can say me too loudly over and over and over again. Starting with white supremacy is how I will get at the heteropatriarchy, how I will get at rape culture, how I will get at all of the other oppressions that I can understand more deeply personally. Um, so that's a bit about me and why I give my time and my energy to this work. And also the people that I'm working with are amazing. So I'll just say that too. So it's really deeply fulfilling to build relationship with them. Thank you. Thanks for that testimony. You know, um, we had drum on last week, as you know, and um, we talked a lot about youth there. And that's, that's certainly a topic I think we'll want to get back to today. I, I think the panel definitely shares your passion around that in many, many ways. Chris, how about you? And how did you get involved in how you're, you're um, a congregational minister. Um, and I'm curious how you see the work at that you're doing with ARE working with congregational life. Um, Cause I think we all agree that's kind of where a lot of it breaks down. <laughs> I mean, it breaks down everywhere. If we can say that it breaks down every single, every single heart, mind, body. But when we get into our congregations is where at least it can feel like it's interactively stuck. So I'm, I'm curious yeah. how you feel like the work at ARE impacts your work in a congregation and, and a little bit of your story like Alka did. Sure. Um, so I, you know, I guess because we just observed World AIDS Day, I've been thinking a lot about the time period when I, as a young man, was was living through providing aid services and watching friend after friend die and being told that our lives didn't matter um, and that we deserved to die um, and that the families that we had created with each other often because our our family we were born into had rejected so many of us um, didn't matter either. Um, and so um, that led me into an entire career before I even became a UU minister that had to do with this kind of work and seeing that if they could, if people could say my life doesn't matter and they can say that black lives don't matter, um, there's, there's a relationship there. There's an intersexuality. So I ended up doing, um, HIV AIDS work and anti-oppression work and then going into uh, immigration work um, and now our church it's interesting we, we have our second person in sanctuary um, because if he's returned to El Salvador he'll be killed um, and he's been with us for over a year because ICE just will not work with us. Um, his immigration judge told him that he believed his asylum case but he wasn't going to grant it anyway. Um, and it's interesting right now it's cold out and our electricity is out in the church building because we're under construction and renovation. So for two weeks, um, we've had to place him elsewhere, but we were able to get ICE to give him a four month stay of removal. So at least we know he's safe until the electricity is back on. In terms of the work in the church, I think that my work with ARE feeds the work in the church. For instance, we have formed a sort of local chapter of ARE and, and one of the things that I struggle with as a minister, especially working with white folks in the church is, you know, we always hear this and it came up on the, on the, with drum last time, um, this thing about meeting people where they are. And that doesn't really work for me because when I work with a group of white people, where they are is going to be very, very different, even if it's only 10 people. And so the language that I need to use with a person who's in denial versus a person who is in minimization is a different language and a different goal. And so I think what really helps is ARE gives me language for all of those people. And it shifts my perspective to not how can I meet this person where they are, but how can I challenge them where they are so that transformation and progress is, is possible, so. Well, you're starting to talk about how you do the work. And Laurie, as you, um, as you kind of share a little bit of your story, I'd love to hear, Chris started to lay out some of the language that you offer, but you know, what are you, I mean, I know that you've been meeting with congregations and, and I'm sure that that's changed over time and I'd love to hear some of what you've learned and where you are now with it. 
So first of all, who's our new guest or host? Christina has a lovely little furry bell. Wow. This is this is Tika Picante. Oh, and hello, Picante. <laughs> <laughs> who often comes and joins us. <laughs> and is, so and is here for it. It's here for the work. <laughs> That's a little puppy fist raised. <laughs> Right. Well, well, dogs can be quite useful in action. I know that much. Um, all right. So a little bit of the why of why I got involved with ARE. And I'll tell you, it comes from a slightly different place. And I don't know if that's because I'm I'm one of the lay leaders that's uh, represented here or just because um, from the Leadership Collective or if it's just because of my unique situation within Unitarian Universalism. But um, my why for getting involved with ARE was I, I've, I've been on kind of the margins of Unitarian Universalism to some degree, uh, not being able to find a good fit in any of the congregations uh, for my particular way of expressing my spirituality. In the Midwest, it was very difficult. Uh, I, I was embracing a much more embodied spirituality when all of the congregations in my vicinity in the Heartland District at that time were very humanist, very like Protestant stayed kind of like feeling, not Protestant in theology, but Protestant in like worship style. So, and the, it, so I, I was always kind of like one foot in, one foot out, not quite sure where I was with Unitarian Universalism. And when I finally decided to truly embrace it and stay with it, I was like, okay, then I have to like work to make it be able to fit me and people like me. And that meant to work on the white supremacy that was in the culture of Unitarian Universalism that manifests itself in many ways, including this uh, false dichotomy of head and heart and hum humanist and spiritual. That's like part to me, and that's a manifestation of white supremacy right there. So, um, just in my little bubble of the world. Uh, so when I did that, I decided I needed to get more involved. Um, and I approached ARE and asked them if I could help. What can I do? And they put me to work. So that's how I got involved and why I'm here. Um, as far as our congregational engagement, that also kind of, I think, has roots in some of my experience and, and other people's experience as well. Our congregations are how most people learn about or like first contact Unitarian Universalism if they're coming in instead of like being fully raised in Unitarian Universalism. And even those folks too, right? Their, their first contact is in the home and then in the churches. And the culture of our churches um, just, it, it has a lot to do with some of the uh, stories we were hearing last week with drum and the struggles uh, people of color have uh, with the uh, the tax, the emotional tax and physical tax of being a Unitarian Universalist and not being white. There's just a lot to that. And it takes a lot to stay in it and choose every day to keep claiming and reclaiming the faith that is ev everyone's birthright, but it doesn't always feel that way. So our task as ARE um, is to confront that white supremacy culture make it visible to people because that's how it operates is by being invisible and just just how we do things around here and and so by really helping congregations and leaders within congregations both clergy and lay leaders uh to make it visible for themselves and then for their their congregants that's when change can happen so are has been engaging with congregations more directly in the last uh, several months, and then now uh, going forward uh, to provide coaching and consulting services and training uh, when needed, uh, tailored for each situation uh, within congregations to help really transform the cultures. So we, we talked last week a little bit about how white supremacy just shifts around and moves, you know, and, and um, so I'm curious when you're doing this work in congregations, um, well, Chris, I'll start with you. You 
you talked about people who minimize and people in denial. So if you're if you're in a congregation, is part of what you do to assess with them where they are, or how how do you go into a congregation and help them with that, or how do you how do you, how do you meet people? Period to try yeah. to help us all and transform. Yeah, thanks, and, and and I can really talk about the work that I'm doing in my congregation because I haven't been as big a part yet of the work that Lori and some others have been doing going out to other congregations. Um, I think that. Um, one of the things that we've done, and when I say we, it wasn't just me, it was uh, an, another minister who was a person of color, is we've focused on the need for both separate caucuses um, and for those caucuses to come together. So for us, I'm talking about an Allies for Racial Equity caucus where white people meet alone to do the work that we need to do um, and in the ways that we need to do it without burdening people of color as, as white folks go through what they need to go through. Um, and then there's a separate people of color group, but then we also come together and do some studying together and, and read together. You asked, do we help people assess where they are? Yes, we've actually, for instance, done training on that intercultural developmental model, offered people the chance if they wanted to take the testing to, to figure out where they are. Um, and we've had to do some things like, again, if I've got a group where there's people at vastly different stages, we even have to se separate out those caucuses sometimes because it's a different set of language um, that we, we need to use. Um, one of the things that Elka said that I steal from her um, is, um, and, and that I share with folks in our church, is we have to do this work because if we don't, our faith is a lie. We don't mean the things that we say as a faith and we don't observe the principles and the, and the theology that we claim unless we do this work. Um, and I found that after stealing it from Elka to be a very powerful thing with folks. Um, so thank you, Elka. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm glad it's, it's helping. It tears my heart apart a little bit when, every time I say it and hear it, but but it's, it's a huge reason I do this work too. So yeah, I'll could talk a little bit. You, your official position, it looks like, is working with the youth in Muncie, but mm -hmm. hopefully that um, is not a little silo that's unconnected to the other pieces of the congregational life. So I'm curious what, you, what you're seeing with youth now versus when 20 years ago when you were doing the work uh, with Why Are You You, how, how you're seeing um, particularly white youth um, because I, I think what we hear a lot is, oh, this is going to change because the youth are so different. And that's not what studies seem to bear out. So I'm really curious, you know, what you're, what you're noticing coming, coming back with another generation and working with youth. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, I think it's cyclical. I think it's much like last week, you, were, you all were talking about the cycle of awakening and sleeping the way that we do uh, as a whole institution. Uh, I think that's true for the youth as well. Um, but I'll speak for my youth that I work with at, at our church. Um, they care really deeply about the principles of our faith. They care really deeply about everyone feeling valued and loved and like they belong and their awakening to, which I get to watch sometimes and it's really beautiful, I get to be a part of sometimes, their awakening to acknowledging that not everyone feels that way in our congregations uh, breaks their heart, right? Uh, I have, and I, I say this really frequently to them and at large, um, I get the opportunity to be with a youth group that makes you feel like you're in a hug as soon as you walk in for me. Uh, but I don't know if that would be true to the same extent for a person of color, right? Uh, we don't have any people of color in our youth group right now. Uh, and so I'm, I'm working with them because they don't have the national organizations working on, uh, 
youth anti-racism movement building the way that we did when I was a youth. Uh, so I'm working with them as their coordinator of youth programs because I care about this, but there's no guarantee that any other youth director or DRE in any of our other congregations is doing this work with the youth and they're eating it up and loving it. And it's amazing to watch them, but unless there's someone bringing it to them, they could easily go through a why are you experience without having these kinds of awakening moments. Uh, we're doing several justice oriented things this year, including a lock-in in, in a couple weeks on Black Panther, which they're super excited about and the ways in which um, racial justice ties into that film. Um, and I try to weave it throughout everything that I do because it's so central to who I am, yeah. but it's not for all of our religious professionals, right? So I can't speak for what is happening in a larger youth movement because there really isn't one right now that I'm aware of. And that breaks my heart. Christina, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts. About <laughs> <laughs> Why would I? Just because I've expressed them before. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really hard, um, you know, for those of us who, you know, I didn't grow up UU, um, but I see so many of our current uh, leadership who did, who did come up through YRUU and have really strong um, faith formation experiences in what used to be LRY and YRUU after it. And it really concerns me that we don't have um, an equivalent holding of our current, our current youth and, and coming up youth and, and what is that gonna mean for the future of our faith? Um, as well as, you know, what happened that we felt like we could abdicate our responsibility um, to both our ancestors um, and our future generations. Um, and, and all of this is, is absolutely about, you know, white supremacy culture and the work that, that ARE and DRUM are doing. Um, and we talked a little bit about this at DRUM last week is that, you know, it was working. It was working, right? Um, and I think that that is, is really undergirds a lot of um, why the, the rug was pulled out from under it. Um, and I don't think at the time, or maybe at the time, you all were there, I wasn't. <laughs> um, I think there was some of that, of that, you know, of that fear of it, of it working. Um, but I also think there was also, you know, just some, some, um, you know, the white lash of, of, you know, when you see change, um, you know, white supremacy tries to reassert its dominance in ways that if you don't call out, hey, this is white supremacy happening right here in front of us, um, you know, it, it just it happens. And, and I'll hold that calling that out um, does not come without a, a price, a cost uh, to the folks. And, um, you know, historically in our faith, the folks who have paid that price have been a use of color. And so, um, you know, I think it's super important to have groups like ARE uh, when we're doing this work so that we can have white colleagues who are willing to um, buffer that, that cost. Um, you know, when we were going to do the white supremacy teaching, like you all were some of the first that we called, right? And we were like, hey, we're going to do this thing. And, and we are three uh, religious professionals and religious educators of color, you know, leading a team uh, who are doing this, we're going to need you all to, you know, get out there and, and block for us a little bit. Um, and, you know, without hesitation, you all were just like, yeah, Tell us where you want us to be, what you want us to do. Um, and that means a lot. And, and I think that accountability relationship, you know, um, is something I, I'd actually love to hear from you all. But going back to the, to the youth portion of it, um, I, I don't think it's something that we can drop and, and 
you know, I always preface when I say this because I have deep love for our, our youth office, our UUA youth office, like in the folks that are doing this work. This is not a drag on them. They are doing a tremendous job with the resources that they have. Um, and they have a deep and abiding love for our UU youth. I see that all the time. I see it with my own children. Um, and I just really, really want to reaffirm the work that they're doing, um, that this is not about that. Um, this is really about how collectively we have um, allowed white supremacy to take something that was working and kind of scary because it was working and um, and let it go. And, and we need to, if we don't have people continuing to say that, um, it's never going to change. Like we have to challenge this structure that says um, this is just the way it's going to be and say, no, we know it can be different. We have, ab we absolutely have proof that it's different. We have leaders right now sitting at the table because they were in those spaces. Um, and we, we absolutely have to continue to say that out loud um, and, and challenge where those resources are. I think we I, need to have a whole show on this. If, if you may, may I add another another layer to this, Meg? Uh, sure, Michael, um, add another layer. So, so yes, yes to everything um, that was just said, and um, you know, and a note that the the staff of the Youth and Young Adult Office is about a third the size of the staffs of the Youth and Young Adult and Campus Ministry offices ten years ago. So, yeah, you know, there's only so much that people can do. Uh, <laughs> when when things get cut as the former director of the yeah. well, and the the piece i want to add and the former director of the youth office yeah right. the piece i want to add to you know like you said meg people keep saying oh things are going to change because the youth like get things so much differently that requires us to have a faith that our youth stay in um so you know for every elka there are probably 10 white youth who are no longer Unitarian Universalists. And for every Alandria Williams, there's probably 50 youth of color that are no longer Unitarian Universalists. And, and I, I use those numbers specifically to point out that, that the white supremacy culture, as it intersects with the culture of devaluing the participation of youth and young adults, um, disproportionately affects our young people of color. Um, and I, I think that we need to recognize that, 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 you know, so many young people of color that I worked with, um, they, they're, they're not Unitarian Universalist anymore. That is so it true, Michael. Hard. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because um, it, it's real. And like, even for my own children, like me trying to find them a Latino young adult you you as a mentor like <laughs> it's been rough and god bless the the folks that have you know stepped forward you know to to do that for them um but you know time and time again you know they had um young adult uh, young men of color adult mentors um that this con that this that Unitarian Universalism has run, not just not supported, but run off. And, you know, it, it, if, if they can't see themselves reflected somewhere in this space, how on earth are they expect, or do we expect them to stay? Okay, we're gonna do a whole show on this, I vow. Um, as I said in the Barry Street lecture last year, if we don't care about the youth, I don't think we get to say we're a religion because what, who are we then? We're a club. So, but we're gonna talk about accountability. Christina brought that up and, and I, I'm curious and Chris mentioned it and a couple of you have mentioned it about accountability with drum and, uh, and I'm, so I'm curious how that works. Laura, you wanna jump in? Yeah, um, so accountability for, for ARE, is directly to DRUM, an elected body of people of color who um, called us into being 
and who set out formal, we as a community, as a, as a both, both communities set out account accountability guidelines uh, to this uh, body of, of people of color. And so we're accountable, uh, it's grounded in covenant, it's grounded in um, agreement, mutual agreement, and it's grounded in relationship. And how accountability looks for white folks working in anti-racism, I think is something that, uh, it's a very challenging thing to be unlearning our own, like where white supremacy has been um, playing in our own selves and our own bodies and our own thinking. And then also to be like, just to something as simple as taking leadership from people of color, like, Many white folks do not have any experience with this whatsoever. <laughs> so, <laughs> even folks who are theoretically woke. <laughs> so so uh, accountability is something that you don't get to like, like take a two hour class and get the certificate and now you're accountable. It's an ongoing negotiation. It's, it goes on and on forever. I'm, I'm constantly falling short of my own promise of accountability, even though I've been in the work for several years. Uh, so we just constantly have to be very careful about not relying on the fact that we're accountable and we get to do whatever we want because of that. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> there's, there's constant check-ins and so forth that are, are required. <laughs> and I, I feel like we're one of the things I remember from last week's drum uh, interview that y'all did is talking about lines of accountability, not only to uh, for us to each other, drum and ARE, but also to the broader association. So like, what does accountability look like to our membership, for example? So the leadership collective is this small group of like 18 people. And then we've got membership, we've got over 400 members. So what's our accountability as a leadership collective to that, those members, and then to the broader association, to congregations, to the, to the Unitarian Universalist Association, to the leadership there, and then vice versa, because it is a two-way street. So how are, how are we accountable to uh, not only the association, but how is the association accountable to us, the, the members and the, the people who make up the association? And so, so can I, uh, may I go jump ahead. in and ask you a question? Uh, recently, ARE um, issued a, a statement to the Association of Disappointment in uh, their financial commitment to drum and to this work. And, um, and I was thrilled to see y'all do that. Uh, have you received pushback for doing that? You don't need to get specific about it. I, I, I'm not trying to call people out. I'm just wondering, because as Christina said, there are consequences especially for people of color, but also for white people for speaking truth to power. Y'all want me to take that? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think many of us have mentioned today that uh, white supremacy culture can clap back pretty hard and pretty fierce and pretty fast. And so one of the things that we did recently in support of DRUM was to amplify a message of one of our leadership collective members uh, who had written a message in reply to the press release that the association sent out during our retreat and during DRUM's retreat in October, celebrating uh, the commitment of funding to drum um, in the amount of $50,000. And that celebration was framed as a, um, uh, as renewing the partnership with drum, the, the UUA's partnership with drum, which we're happy about. We're glad that they're on the right track. Um, the criticism came uh, from our, our collective member in the, that understanding that this is a, not a time for celebration, this is a time for forced contrition that this is, this was like demanded and begged, like literally, I think Renoir said that, begging. Um, it's a hard thing to do is have to go to your leadership and beg for 
to, you know, basic funding when it used to be funded every year to the tune of over $40,000. And now they're just asking for some, you know, some kind of return to some kind of funding. And so the, the, we, one of the things we, that came out of our retreat in October is that we want to be clear about our context and be honest about our history. So it was very timely and important for us to add context to that press release and to be honest about our history as an association that this is a time of forced contrition rather, that was requested and asked in a, in a, from a position that was not acknowledged in that press release. So we did go ahead and issue that statement. And to your point, Meg, yes, the clapback was fast and furious. Uh, so we have had, we are, we are dealing with institutional pushback right now on that, um, on that messaging that we did. So it's an ongoing thing. It is an ongoing thing. And I, and I think, um, your point of the forced contrition is really important um, because I feel like, you know, we're at a, another one of those pivot moments as an association. Um, and, you know, I feel like we can do things the easy way or we can do things the hard way. And it would be wonderful if we chose to do some of this the easy way, the way that we could celebrate, like truly celebrate and be um, excited and be proactive, you know, in, in some of this, um, as opposed to, you know, being, I don't wanna say forced into a corner cause that's not, that's not, as opposed to the urgency of pressure of having to make a public ask in front of God and everybody to say, to put pressure to do the right thing, right? And, it, you know, if that's what it's going to take, that's what it's going to take. And by any means necessary, I'm, I'm for it. I just wish that we as an association could, um, be a little bit more proactive so we could be a little bit more joyful about it. And yes, to also naming the history behind it. And, um, but I just feel like when we have these moments, you know, it, it could have been such a joyful, uh, it could have been such a joyful thing to fund drum, right? We, we just missed an opportunity to just say yes and, and then figure it out and be excited and happy and, joyful about it. Um, and and, and to I be just clear, we are very about joyful it. about it and yeah. we wanna be clear about our context and be honest about our history. Exactly. And, and be honest about like, not just our history, but like how this happened. Like even just the funding that did happen. Like, let's be, <laughs> let's be real about how well, that, that went down, right? Yeah. Like that's how that history doesn't get painted um, properly is when we just kind of ignore, um, you know, how, how that went down. So I'm, I'm just hopeful that we can get to a place of abundance and generosity and, and, you know, be able to be excited about it and about these kinds of things while still naming how painful the history is that, that it's coming out of. Yeah, I, th I, I would agree. And I think that one of the things that, um, you know, ARE does is uh, kind of acts as a lightning rod for that clapback uh, from white supremacy culture, because otherwise it would be directed at drum. Um, and so thank you for, for being there to get that now. I, I've been in your seat. <laughs> before on, on other issues in the past. We have some things coming up on our, on our I guess, Facebook live feed. Ronnie Boyd has asked a question. Um, Ronnie writes, I'm wondering if ARE has thought through how our faith values compound our white supremacy culture. And that is such an interesting question. Um, I'm hoping that that one of you might, uh, might answer that. I think Elka, you, you have some things to say to that? Sure, uh, I think, so the part of our faith that I think really most obviously 
uh, supports white supremacy culture is the individualism that is central to how we understand ourselves, um, which I'll add was not the intent of the Cambridge platform, uh, but is the way that we've interpreted it in our modern context, uh, that each individual has uh, supreme control over themselves and what comes out of their mouth and they're maybe not accountable to that uh, being kind uh, or being called out. Uh, and we operate the same way with the Unitarian Universal Association, right? Our, our institutions, our congregations uh, claim staunch, fierce individualism in response to the hierarchy of the UUA. Uh, and that um, individualism is one of the main uh, attributes of white supremacy culture that Timo Kohn talks about in their article. Uh, it's, and that's one of the can reasons you, why- you, Can you say the Timo Okun article that you just referenced? What, what is that? Jessica could, could push it out. Um, oh yeah, we have it um, all over our Facebook stuff. So I'm sure Carolina, who's um, one of our leadership collectives could put it in the chat for us. Thank you. Uh, it lists uh, a variety of really important ways in which white supremacy culture works. Uh, and we've been, as a leadership collective, engaging deeply in how to uh, digest that information and use it in our work. Uh, it's really quite helpful for folks to, to unpack. Um, and that, that individualism is one of the reasons why we have changed the way we organize ourselves, why we, we use the term leadership collective, um, why we have 18 people on leadership. And when you ask us who's in charge, we'll say all 18 of us, uh, which is frustrating to white supremacy culture, right? Um, and the UUA and other organizations struggle with how to deal with that. We don't have a, a single leader uh, and that's part of the point, right? So I think that's one way. And I think Ronnie pointed out also that um, the way in which we value our own opinion so strongly, uh, we struggle with cultural humility. It's a huge part of our sort of implicit culture as Unitarian Universalists. Uh, and that's something that one of the ways in which we have to continue to shift our culture if we want to be the faith that we say we are. Uh, and that's, I think, part of building the white resilience that is central to how Airy sees our work uh, is helping folks build the cultural humility that allows them to then be resilient in the face of being called out and being called out and being called out. Uh, because that is necessary as we continue to learn and grow and become better. That's just a tiny piece of the answer because I don't have time for a whole sermon series right now. I, can I jump in on, on that? Please. I Thank you, Elka. And I, I also just want to mention that for me, our theology is so grounded in covenant and relationship and like even the ARE leadership um, group wanted to ground our work in collective liberation theology, and yet that can get turned around and used against people of color with the covenant used as sort of a weapon to strike back if people of color call us out on our own BS as white people. Um, so to tie it back to the discussion about our accountability, for me, a large part of our accountability also has to do with continuing to do our own darn work, even as we do all this other stuff. And the example I'll give is while we were having our leadership collective retreat, I was the facilitator who said, look, some of these aspects of white supremacy are that if someone gets emotional, we're going to do our best to ignore that. Right. Because by our very nature, we were a group of white people in a room being the white allies for racial equity. And we tend to be goal oriented and, and focused on tasks. And yet later on in the retreat, I found myself being the one to ask, so what's our goal here? What are we trying to accomplish? You know, and so 
I have to even push back against myself, you know, and, and keep doing this work. Um, so th that's a part of our accountability also. Yeah, our retreat was really quite rich. We've never done this before. Um, we just gathered in October to, as a leadership collective, as everyone from the leadership collective who was able to be there, whether in person or over Zoom. Uh, and it was the first time all together that we had really sat with this consensus model that we are now under, that we don't vote on how to move forward. We uh, consents on everything, which is real hard for white folks. Um, and there was constant tension, right? There, it was constantly, how are we moving forward and how are we sitting with what we're doing and how are we building relationship? Uh, but I also wanna lift up that one of the most important things that we did while we were there uh, is we created and began the creation process of a full timeline of, uh, Allies for Racial Equity's work uh, because we don't learn and teach our history very well. That, and that's one of the things that Drum lifted up last week of uh, what the three things that they asked that we do, we Unitarian Universalists do to support them. One of those was learn and teach our history. Uh, so we started by creating a timeline of the major events and things that have happened within ARE and anti-racism in the UUA's history just since ARE was created uh, about a decade ago now. And we are now turning that information into a uh, usable interactive timeline so that people can really engage with what our history is as an organization, as they join as members, as they join as a part of the leadership collective, or as they are just figuring out who we are, uh, because it's so essential that we know that context that we are in. Context is everything when it comes to this work. Uh, and it was really profound to be in that room. We had uh, Jenny Quarter, who was one of the folks in the room for some of the founding of ARE with us for that um, and, and a whole bunch of people with different pieces of the information. And it was really beautiful to watch it organically get created together. Uh, yeah. Oh, we uh, see Jim Quarick Graham saying he thinks that was the most important thing that happened at the retreat. And I'm sorry if I said your name wrong, I seem to do that. And um, we're just coming to the last five minutes here. So I'd love to hear as you look out over the horizon where you're, where you're going this year. I'll go ahead and start um, because I tend, I'm the treasurer. I, I tend to be the bean counter. I tend to be the one that concretizes a lot of the stuff. So, and I know that Chris and Elka, they can tie prettier bows than I can. <laughs> so... Um, I am so excited about the growth in our, um, uh, I'm going to start with the money, uh, the growth in our, what I'll call reparations programming <laughs> and uh, getting white folks within Unitarian Universalism to commit to um, giving away money, to redistributing funds. So in just this year alone, in 2018, we were able to distribute 60% of our revenue directly to POC-led organizations and individuals engaged in this work. So that is over $20,000 we were able to give um, directly. So that is something I'm really excited about continuing and expanding. That's something that ARE, to my knowledge, has never done before to that degree. Uh, so I'm excited about that. I'm truly excited also about seeing the new leadership uh, develop. The, it, we've got uh, people coming in to the leadership collective that are, when we were at that retreat, we had people from three generations all together working, and that was so important. And I just saw so much energy coming out of that. So I'm very excited to see that happen as well. And I'm excited to see where we go with um, our relationship with Drum. Thanks. Chris, how about you? 
Yeah, all, all of what Lori said. And I'm excited about doing more of the sort of tailored individual work, both with our congregations and for leaders in our congregation who need mentoring in this kind of work, and also providing some pastoral support um, as people encounter the inevitable pushback and the inevitable things that are going to come up for them as they do this work. So that would, that would be the areas, in addition to what Lori just talked about, that I'm really excited about. Alka, anything to add? Sure, I thought Lori might lift this up, so I'll lift it up since she didn't. Uh, we applied for a grant from the EU funding panel uh, in order to help us enable to do that work, and we received a large chunk of what we asked for. Uh, and we're going to use that primarily to do coaching and consultancy within congregations uh, to go where we are asked to go and to help people build capacity. Uh, and I think that's really central to how we want to work going forward is um, the way that the UUA has done things for a long time is here's the curriculum of the day, let's use this. And once we do it, we have fixed racism in our congregation. Um, and that we know is not how it works. Uh, so we're trying to build a model where we really help congregations dig deep, dig deeper and deeper and deeper and build more capacity and build more capacity and build more capacity. Uh, so we are creating opportunities for that to happen in our denomination right now. And it's very exciting. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for this work. Thanks for your creativity and willingness to do the uncomfortable stuff. I mean, I must say, when you say uh, consensus with 18 people, I go, oh. so, yeah. you know, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for um, creating new pathways. Lori, yes? So I'm, I'm noticing here that uh, we, also another huge thing we did was we developed and adopted a new covenant this year with our expanded leadership collective. And so we're going to go ahead and paste that into the chat. Uh, so just want to let sure make sure people realize that that's coming um, out soon too. Oh, good. That's a helpful template for other people to use. Michael or Christina, any last words here today? I'm just really grateful for Ari. I'm, I'm grateful for the work you do, the way you do the work, um, even more than the work sometimes. And and as a UUPOC, I'm grateful for a place to send really well-intentioned white folks um, that I don't have to um, always educate them and just say, you know what, there is a great group of folks that you need to meet. Yes, offload that emotional labor. <laughs> Next week, we have uh, Michael Crumpler coming to talk about the Welcoming Congregation Renewal Program, something new there. Thanks so much for coming. We hope you'll come back and keep us surprised of what's up. And thanks for your good work. Hope everybody has a good week. Thank you. Thank, thank you.